，二零二二年全球增长前景如何？世界主要经济体的复苏面临哪些分化和挑战？稳定通胀预期，全球超宽松货币政策将如何转向？新兴市场的资本流入态势将面临哪些不确定？新周期下，全球如何在气候政策、数字科技和持续发展等方面加强合作与治理？第十二届财新峰会，世界经济复苏周期与展望。好，我们接下来。Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to invite the moderator of this round, Mr. Huang Shen, the deputy managing editor of Taishing Media, editor in chief of Taishing Summit. Welcome, sir. Also, the uh, deputy prime minister Hans Wicket, and uh, your remarks really reminds me that uh, you know three years ago, when before the pandemic struck the world, actually I interviewed you at uh, in Davos uh, World Economic Forum. So it's it's really a beautiful memory, and I hope next year we know the Davos will come back to the uh, to uh, come back again, and uh, we really hope that uh, um, when the vaccine vaccination um, really spread to the uh, The whole world, and we can really get back life back to normal. Oh, without further ado, and、uh, I will say a few words before we start this panel discussion. We know as the world economy recovers from the pandemic, new headaches surface. Inflationary pressure clogged key infrastructure, such as ports, railroads, and warehouses. Labor and raw materials shortages, power crunches. Just to name a few of them. On top of these unbalanced supply and demand relations, we have seen a further bifurcating world: vaccine divide, wealth divide, and the digital divide between the north and the south. Also, climate crisis and the more frequent currency occurrences of extreme weather events put great strain on emerging market economies and developed economies. A rise in bond yields in advanced economies or a deterioration in global risk sentiment could push up debt servicing costs for e,、uh, emerging market economies, sovereigns, and businesses. So it triggers capital outflows and stresses eco emerging economies' financial system. So I think today we have a three, uh, sorry, uh, six uh, panel uh, this,、uh, joining this discussion. Uh, economic uh, recovery out,、uh, outlook, and three of them will join us the in person. The three of them will join us virtually, and I think this is the、uh, new normal in this the、uh, still the、uh, COVID the ravaged world. And without further ado, I will uh, uh, invite uh, two, uh, three of、uh, in person attendees, attendees come to the stage, and、uh, we can share the floor and、uh, with our three uh, virtual uh, participants. Please come in. Thank you, and I will very quickly go through the all three、uh, source six panelists. The first one is the Mr. Yu Yongding. Yu,、uh, Professor Yu Yongding uh, is the uh, 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 Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, and he will join us virtually. And、uh, he specializes in international finance and Chinese economic growth. And the second、um, panelist is the、uh, Ambassador Chapius. We know Mr. M. Chapius has long uh, and uh, Uh, linkage to China, and we know、um, his Chinese、uh, given name Bai. I think derived from one of Chinese most famous the、uh, poets Li Bai. So definitely, you 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 know, you know, he he's had long you know expe、uh, experience experience with China. And the third uh, uh, panelist will be uh, uh, Mr. Bert Hoffman, and he joined us virtually from Singapore. He is the director of East Asian Institute and the professor at National University of Singapore.、Uh, And he previously he served as the World Bank country director、uh, for China, and the, the fourth uh, uh, panelist is uh, Mr. Anil、uh, Kushora. 
Um, he's the vice president, the chief risk officer uh, of a new development bank, uh, uh, which is based in uh, Shanghai. And the fifth panelist is Eric Bergerov, is one of the old friends of uh, Chai Xing. And he's uh, a chief economist of AIIB. Previously, I think, uh, joined AIIB in September 2020. Uh, uh, Eric was director of the uh, Institute of Global Affairs London School of uh, Economics. L last but definitely not least is the Mr. Uh, Neo, uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Uh, Ninami. Um, he's a chief executive officer of uh, Santori Holdings. Actually, outside of Santori, we know the, the uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Ninami has been the uh, senior economic uh, advisor uh, to three consecutive Japanese prime minister, from Prime Minister Shinzo Abe to Prime Minister Suga and the current Prime Minister, Mr. Prime Minister Kishida. So, great. So, let me uh, announce a, a little bit the uh, grounding rule. Uh, ground rules for our discussion. So each panelist will be given five to ten, uh, eight minutes to make your main points and uh, your main presentation. After that, I will raise the first round of questions to you know just follow up your presentation with my my, my, my first round of questions. Then after that, we will have uh, go into the second round of questions. So we'll wrap up at uh, twelve o'clock. So uh, first of all, uh, let me have the uh, Mr. Yu Yongding to make your uh, uh, your, your opening remarks, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Due to time restraints, I'm afraid I have to be brief, so I would like to talk about my thoughts about the status quo. I would like to talk a little bit first up the economic development of the United States, 2% in the third quarter, obviously lower than the expectation of the market. In terms of employment, it's also getting better. Uh, unemployment rate is a it's about 4.6% down by 4%. In terms of labor engagement, it's also getting better. However, however, it's still lower than expectation. Now, the biggest problem in the United States is inflation. It's expected that the rise will be more than expectation. 5.4% 5, 5 in September and then 6.2% in October. Now, there is one major problem in macroeconomic policy, that is to keep a balance between employment and economic development. Now, at the beginning of this year, Powell and Janet Yellen pointed out that a great, even greater challenge is that due to COVID-19 pandemic, Americans actually were afraid to consume after about, you know, over about a year, actually, their opinions changed a little bit. So Powell actually changed a little bit towards curbing inflation. That is because the expectation of bottles will continue until next year. So it is hoping that inflation rate might drop next year. As a matter of fact, they're taking a risk. On the one hand, they're sending a signal to the society to concern more about inflation expectation. On the other hand, actually, he's not really concerned. He's not really worried about it because with new monetary policies, things might get better. What about the cost of inflation? Actually, people have different opinions. Most tend to believe, you know, those supporting. Uh, dropping out of or dropping the loose monetary policy believes that inflation will be the cause of economic downturn. However, for the opponents, they believe that uh, the issues or problems, challenges alongside the supply chain with the core issue, which believe that it is only a short-term issue. However, for Janet Yellen and Powell, they actually belong to the second the letter, they believe to it is necessary to quit QE. However, the result was not really satisfactory, so the withdrawal should be stable. The Fed announced to quit QE recently. Let's take a look at the market figures. Actually, the stock market increased rapidly. 
be much more beyond an expectation in terms of returns on um, sovereign bonds. The numbers actually drop in terms of forex rate of, the, of U.S. dollar. It actually reached the highest point in the recent years. So our problem is whether or not we're facing the real problem in the past years or even past 10 years. We often heard that the United States, the Fed, was going to quit QE. If we take a look at the list that listed on the right side of the slide, you see that at different years, there were discussions about withdrawal of QE, and there were even some measures taken accordingly. However, in the real-life scenarios, the Fed, if we take a look at their balance sheet, actually, we saw an expansion, particularly since 2020. The expansion of balance sheet of the Fed was very obvious. Up to $7 trillion from $4 trillion U.S. dollar since the COVID-19 pandemic outbreak. So before the pandemic, the number actually was much lower. Now, is it true that the Fed is really going to withdraw QE? I always say that even if they might do so, the withdrawal process will still be stable and smooth. However, we have to be concerned that the policies might not be stable. There will also be uncertainties which we have to pay attention to. Now, the biggest uncertainty still comes from COVID-19. If we take a look at the status quo of the United States, it's not really stable again. Now, yesterday, about seven, 70,000 people were diagnosed with COVID-19. And the uh, prospects for the COVID-19 is clear, is unclear. So the unclear or uncertainty remain with our economy. Let's look at Europe. Europe bounced back nicely in Q3, 3.7 percent year-on-year growth, and uh, inflation remained the same in EU and 4.1. Ever since uh, July 2017, this was the highest. The Central Bank of EU policy um, had a few changes at the present. The Central Bank of EU believed that inflation is only for interim, which can slow down the purchase of the bonds, but there is no plan to cut the volume of bonds. Anyway, the Central Bank of EU decided to do nothing, and Japan have no further changes either. After reflecting on these statistics, we can come to some simple conclusions like this. The global economy is going back. The global inflation is deteriorating, especially in the U.S. Unless COVID-19 deteriorates, I think that the global economy goes back in a stable way, and the countries didn't change their policies because of inflation or um, make ready to the monetary or other policies, because countries are very cautious in these measures. So I believe there will be no great impact to the economy. How about its impact in China? This is a question we need to consider. First of all, by what channel trade, capital flow, or other flow to influence China? We also consider such an impact. What will be some major indicators? Economic growth? Will China's macroeconomic policies be influenced? Or some exchange rate will be influenced in China? Anyway, this year or next year, the global economic prospects, Principally speaking, I am optimistic, but I believe we should not exclude any black swan issues. At the same time, such a uh, global economic changes will also have impact on China, which need to be further studied. With that, I finish my views. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yu. After every round, I will come up with one question. Just now, you talked about impact on China. Let's turn another perspective. Yesterday, half a year report from Fed, the global financial stability, it mentioned China's 
China's spillover effects to other countries. In uh, 2008, we talked about uh, the spillover effect from Wall Street or other countries. How about uh, this year? I know that you have a lot of uh, research. China has become a top two global economy and the second the largest market for the stock market and the third market for the for the bonds. China's capital market also have a spillover effect on other countries. So what do you see that when China is growing and in financial terms, how about the China's spillover effect to other financial markets worldwide? What do you think? Shall I answer now? Yes, please. Well, to me, China's capital market, like you said, with China's strength, higher strength in economy, China's capital market gaining more influence, but in its total volume, China's capital market's volume, it has limited impact on the worldwide. At present, we still have uh, a capital restriction, even though in the uh, in these uh, capital accounts uh, uh, liberalization make some progress but still under control. At the present, I think that's uh, the macro monetary or physical policy. We have uh, strong uh, we have strong regulation in China. At the present, the uh, we, we do see some exaggeration on the influence of China's capital market. Let's look at the uh, non-performance rate in China's financial market. China's financial market is relatively stable, even though we may have some problem like Everbright group, but I believe and this kind of issue can be can be controlled. And the foreign investors should not have too much worry on China's capital market. And I still believe that China's capital market development will be a plus to the global financial market. So you should be feel safe with us. And uh, thank you, Mr. Yongding. Uh, Mr. Trapius, so now it's your turn. Yes. Well, uh, may I uh, focus my remarks on the dual transition that we are facing in Europe as well as in China and the rest of the world. Uh, the COVID pandemic has strongly damaged uh, the international global economic scene and everybody is looking for stability, for recovery, but as we see today, the way that economies are bouncing back, and China was one of the first economy to bounce back, I have to take into account uh, the industrial revolutions that we were going through before the pandemic. And if governments have to put money on the table to finance the recovery, and everybody is doing that. You saw how the US Congress has passed part of its uh, stimulus bill. You see how Europe has decided to put 750 billion euros on the table. That's almost $1 trillion. Uh, it has to go through the long-term investment, as the Deputy Prime Minister of Singapore said, on digital and green. And probably the green transition is the most important of the two. Why? Because if we don't have a planet, then we don't have economies. As, uh, when we say it is existential, we mean it. And that's why the European Union has decided that at least 30% of the new money put on the table for the re post-pandemic recovery will be on the green transition. Now, we all know that it's going to be difficult. 
and there are very vivid debates in Europe about exactly how to proceed. But one thing is certain. There is no choice. There is no alternative. Either we do it and we manage to prepare the ground for the future development of our economies, or we don't do it and we are all going to die together. It is as serious as that, I think. Uh, we have in Europe demonstrated that the green transition is economically feasible. There were big doubts, you may recall, five years ago, that was before the pandemic, about the economic sustainability of the green transition. Now, I give you only one figure, uh, but it is a, a very recent figure. It was published uh, two, two weeks ago. The EU 27 member states domestic greenhouse gas emissions were down by more than 30% compared to 1990, while at the same time, in these 30 years, the EU economy grew by more than 50%. And there is a direct correlation there that if you invest in the green economy, you create more growth, not less growth. So, on the digital field, we are accelerating also investments in order to create an EU-wide digital unified market. Uh, and the pandemic has, of course, accelerated. Uh, the Deputy Prime Minister of Singapore spoke about online teaching. Well, uh, in Europe, we have seen uh, how quickly we adapted to something that didn't really exist before the pandemic. And there's still a lot of work to do. Um, so the question today for us, from a European perspective, is how do we align the largest economies to make sure that, one, there is no carbon leakage, huh? quote unquote, that is that uh, uh, the efforts of those who are ambitious will not be negated by those who do not make efforts. So the issue of carbon tax, which was already mentioned, and the second thing is what we call greenwashing. That sometimes we may see so-called green transitions that are not green at all. So how do we ensure globally, and that's the new globalization, the two engines of the new globalization for the green transition apart from technology transfers, would be the carbon tax, which will have finance the transition, but all countries have to play by the same rules. And second, what we call, that's a, not a word I lack, but a shared taxonomy. That is, like Confucius said, Zhang Ming, you need to call things by the proper name. So no greenwashing. Zhang huh? Ming. Uh, so we have been working with China very closely uh, on an international platform to make sure that what we call green is green. Green finance, green investment, green capital. And we have made substantial progress despite the pandemic on these topics which will lay a level playing field for all together to embrace the green transition. On digital, one point of warning for globalization. What we are seeing today is a little bit worrying, especially from some digital behemoths like China. 
which is localization of data. You cannot do a global digital revolution with data localization constraints. And today, we have seen China draft and are beginning to implement new data-related rules which are driving our companies to some serious concerns. We need, to the contrary of data localization rules, we need data adequacy transfer rules so that companies can freely exchange data in a private manner. So there will, this is a new agenda that has to be opened between China and the rest of the world because uh, there won't be a global digital revolution with closed borders on data. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Ambassador Trapius. And uh, you, you actually, I would just uh, point out your, your first point about green transition or green ambition. So actually, we know quite a lot of, you know, when we talk about green ambition, I think it's really uh, one, once a century or once or two centuries ambition. It really has everything to do with the decarbonize the whole entire physical economy. So some critics, you know, point out that uh, Today's economic policies are not to, to, uh, are to a large extent driven by GDP growth targets, rather than a complete reframing of the way the economy is run. So to what extent do you think the world, in particular EU, can achieve the real, as I mentioned, that the real green growth? Well, everybody is confronted to the same issue. Huh? And we, you have seen how, for instance, in China, uh, just before the COP26 opened in Glasgow, the Chinese government introduced guidance and uh, action plans, which are quite interesting in terms of ambition. The question is action. Well, that's your question, you know. Apart from uh, the right words, the right ideas, how do we implement that at the lowest possible social cost? Because like our Singaporean uh, colleague just said, it's, it will be painful. You know, carbon tax. We saw that it drove in France the movement of the yellow vest. The global energy crisis that we have been witnessing now for more than two months is creating huge tensions in Europe with now specific measures taken by governments to mitigate the increase, 15%, 20% increase of uh, gas, fuel, uh, oil products. Because households just cannot do it. It's impossible. Um, but there is, in terms of action, the necessity for governments to, in a transparent way, to show the way for the citizens. So in Europe, what we have done a few, we a few months ago is to adopt a multi-sector strategy, which is, to my knowledge, the, the most detailed uh, strategy today being implemented, which is called Fit for 55, meaning that we will turn the EU 55% emission reduction target in each sector, be it housing, transportation, whatever. But it will create in the next few years certainly some difficult moments. And what we have decided is to accompany 
this transition by social measures each time it is necessary. So you have an economic strategy, which is, as you said, a new framework of economic growth, but accompanied by the necessary intervention of uh, public sector in social policies to ensure that the common citizen can live through that transformation. Great. So I think uh, you, you talk about the EU's measures. It really reminds me of China's one plus n. I think it's uh, you know one means the uh, that we call the top level design, and n means the we multi uh, step up efforts in in specific sectors. For example, the transportation and the livestock and the farming to really make it you know it's a, a two wheel dr driven you know car. I think this definitely you know has some you know uh, echoing effect uh, uh, between EU and, and China. So next, let, let, let's us move to the, our Singaporean uh, conference room. So Professor uh, Hoffman, can you hear me? Okay, now let, it's your turn, please. I to feel a little lonely here in, uh, in Singapore, but there's actually a room full of people here. Thank you. Um, I, have, uh, I have three points, and really they, they complement what Yu Yongding has already said. Um, one, we're actually looking at surprisingly strong growth in the world economy, much stronger than a lot of people expected. Two, it is very uneven growth. And three, uh, it's fraught with a lot of risk going forward. Let me go through each of these three points. Uh, first, the recovery has been very strong. There's projected 5.7% growth this year. I look back, it, it's 1968 that the world grew with 5.7%. So the recovery from the crisis was very strong. Yes, the crisis was, the COVID crisis was very deep, but not as deep as it could have been. It was minus 3.5% last year. Uh, the original projections of the IMF were far worse. But as Ambassador Chapuis said, uh, Western countries, they threw the kitchen sink at the problem and the stimulus was humongous and is still ongoing, especially in the United States. So that's why the, 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 the depth of the crisis was not as deep as one would expect it. Um, and the rebound from minus 3.5 to plus 5.7 percent growth this year is much stronger than, say, after the global financial crisis. A, a, a total rebound of 9.2 percentage point is much stronger than the 5.8 percentage point that we saw after the global financial crisis. So in many ways, this is good news. The not so good news is that this recovery, this rebound is quite uneven and in many ways. 90% um, of advanced economies by the end of 2022 will have recovered to the level that they had before COVID. Only one third of developing and emerging market economies will have recovered to that level. So they have hit far stronger. And it's very clear, there's two reasons for that. One is that there is still a global shortage of vaccines and they're at the short end of it. And two, their policy space is far more limited than in advanced economies. Mind you, uh, the IMF and the World Bank and others had been warning in the run-up to COVID that there was too little policy space for many years. And of course, when the big COVID crisis hit, there was indeed too little policy space. And many of those countries now are facing debt issues that are yet to be resolved and may get worse in the, in the future. The unevenness in the recovery also plays itself out in the supply chain. And, and as an economist, I'm quite fascinated by that. Uh, first, there was the uneven recovery of China and the rest of the world. Now, it is the uneven recovery of goods versus services. Services economy is still quite, quite low in recovery. Travel is still difficult. <clears throat> Excuse me. Tourism is still down. But instead, the demand is now put on manufacturing, and the demand is put on 
um, 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 goods that are needed to deal with COVID, such as electronic equipment that we're using here in abundance. So you have a very strong shift in demand towards manufacturing, an unexpectedly strong shift. And that created shortages in microchips, it created shortages in, in, uh, 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 well, in cars, in, in, in almost everything. And the unevenness across the globe also caused a major bottleneck in transportation. So there was far more manufacturing that needed to go around the world, and far more went from China to the rest of the world, which was not yet recovering, and caused a major disequilibrium in shipping. I believe, and despite Yu Yongding's chart that only goes up, if you look at the Baltic dry, it's already coming down. The Baltic dry index, a major index for tensions in, in, in transportation around the world. Um, it's incredibly important to get that right because these bottlenecks have caused, in part, a shooting up of inflation around the world, or prices, I would say, as an economist. If that is interpreted as inflation, what you would then see is a rapidly phasing out of the loose monetary policies that have supported the recovery. I would personally be afraid of such a premature exit, and I see that as a major short-term risk. What it would mean is also that the developing world is at risk. They're already highly indebted. A change in monetary policies in advanced countries, and especially in the United States, where the fiscal stimulus is still strong, may have ripple effects that could be very damaging for developing economies, as they have, as they have in the past. Of course, the major risk, the second major risk is still COVID. COVID is not gone. And the vaccine distribution is still a major issue. New variants. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that the Deputy Prime Minister is a bit less nervous about that. I'm still very nervous about new variants that might even be vaccine resistant. But in the medium term, I think the uneven recovery will continue to create tensions in the world because the uneven recovery is also playing out domestically in countries. And almost like the global financial crisis, uh, people that had the human capital and the assets to benefit from the crisis are well off. As an academic, I could continue to do my work. Not a problem, as in fact, conferences are easier to do now because you can do it all online. But it's the ordinary workers, it's the service workers that have lost out, that have lost their jobs and have lost out across the world. Second, because of the loose monetary policies, the wealth inequalities have further increased. Those with assets basically benefited in a major way from the policies, not intentionally, but as a byproduct of those policies. And I see rising tensions around the world in domestic politics. That makes it hard to handle a number of the difficult international issues that need to be handled, including COVID. And everybody wants to save the world, everybody wants to avoid climate change. But as soon as you start talking about the difficult issues that, that, that Ambassador Chapuis raised, yes, we need a carbon tax. We need a carbon tax that is higher than the price that is currently in the carbon trading market in Europe, which is around 60 euros right now. You probably by now need 100 euros. That's what economists tell us. And you need 100 euros, and then you need 100 euros of border adjustment of every product coming in. That is a huge bone of contention. A very difficult things, a very difficult things to do, and it requires strong political will that can only be built on strong political basis at home. So I feel that this domestic increase in inequality is a very important point. A final point, a final point is the reaction that I see coming in many countries around the world, and that is a, a, a resurgence of industrial policies. Some of it would be great because it will bring some innovations. But the WTO is not very good in the regulation of industrial policies. And there's a key source of future tension boiling 
that hopefully will be addressed before it boils over. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hoffman. A very quick follow-up question. You talk about the supply chain disruption or supply chain you know, uh, uh, bottlenecks. So do you think it's a temporary or fleeting phenomenon or, uh, or uh, it's a lot of people just dismiss it as a temporary one? But, or, uh, uh, or, you know, it's uh, here to stay, like a more secular, uh, uh, you know, uh, supply chain uh, disruption? Uh, uh, I'm strongly convinced it's temporary, and I think it has already peaked. Be the reason it's temporary because there was an unexpected shift in demand and supplies are adjusting. Second, because there were shortages, people started ordering more of what the shortage was about. It, is, it was like masks in the very early days of COVID. So uh, uh, those that use the goods that are in short supply, they increase their demand to stock up. And that's what you've seen. The third was the shortage in transport. All of them are at peak level and you'll see them calming down. Very important. Thank you, thank you for your uh, answer. Uh, Mr. Uh, Kishara. Now the floor is yours. Thank you. First of all, thanks a lot for giving me this invite. Uh, is it working? Yeah. Yes, yes. As we gather today, discussions at COP26 are coming to an end. Uh, this has been a special uh, conference of the parties as it has taken place amidst the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. The twin challenges of climate change and the pandemic have reminded us again of the need for a sustainable recovery. We all agree on that. And more importantly, sustainable and resilient development going forward. In tackling these challenges, we pave the way for building a community of shared future, the Saishan Summit central theme today. Uh, nature has lately been asserting itself in multiple ways. Uh, Professor Das Gupta of the University of Cambridge has recently highlighted the contribution of natural capital to economic growth and proposed that it be recognized as a critical factor of production. Many of us might echo his views, recognizing nature's limitations in sustaining growth. A potential threshold might exist beyond which nature could drastically change and substantially affect existing growth patterns. So that's an important element to recognize. Uh, in fact, certain climate-induced changes are already considered irreversible. According to the most recent NDC synthesis report, all currently available nationally determined contributions of 192 parties including new or updated submissions, are likely to restrict the increase in global emissions to just 16% in 2030 against the 2010 level, which is pretty low. Uh, the actual outcome, moreover, will depend on workability of the NDCs. On this front, and I think uh, the Deputy Prime Minister from Singapore uh, mentioned in his uh, remarks, uh, we really need advances in energy solutions. These are crucial uh, because you just can't, we have just seen uh, during the recent energy bottlenecks, the kind of uh, uh, trouble we had to undergo. Uh, so energy solutions advances are very, very important. Secondly, and again, uh, the DPM, uh, Mr. Heng Su Kiat uh, mentioned about it, carbon sequestration, technology to capture and deal with historically accumulated carbon is extremely important. Uh, I personally feel that unless we get a breakthrough there, it will be very, very difficult for us to achieve our goals of having a green planet. And of course, it will require funding uh, that will be the key to unlocking ambitious NDCs. Uh, let me uh, spend a, a minute or two on what we as New Development Bank do. As a multilateral development bank, NDB has been working jointly with other MDBs on the climate agenda. At COP26, the MDBs have announced a joint climate statement. 
uh, presenting a brief overview of the collective progress, including our joint approach for Paris alignment and support for countries' long-term strategies towards low emission, resilient development, and of course, just transition. Uh, uh, Professor Hoffman has spoke about the difficulties when you, when you really go to impose uh, carbon pricing and border adjustments, et cetera, and, and that, that's where just transition comes in. How do we handle that? And, and my feeling is that in case we are able to make advances in technology, uh, in terms of energy solutions, and in terms of carbon uh, capturing and dealing with that, it, it will be uh, a, a real breakthrough. Uh, NDB is part of the multilateral efforts uh, set up by the BRICS nations. The, the bank aims to support global growth and development through financing infrastructure and sustainable development. And as some of you might know, NDB was established at the historical juncture when the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement were approved in 2015. Now new members, EMDCs, are joining us and we propose to expand and continue working on our, on our agenda. Uh, beginning our operations in 2015, in the last six years, we have approved 79 projects for about $30 billion. And to date, we have committed about 25% of total approved financing to climate finance. If you leave aside the large size emergency program loans that we did uh, for fighting against COVID-19. Uh, majority of our climate finance has gone to mitigation, such as clean energy, piloting of battery energy storage systems, promotion of mass transit, and procurement of electric vehicles, etc. The bank has also committed to support adaptation through water transfer projects to address drought-induced stress and vulnerability in member countries. Uh, as we move ahead, support for energy transition towards cleaner fuels are going to be our priorities, as these are the priorities for our member countries as well. Uh, we also look forward to prioritizing adaptation and resilience, given the increase in frequency and severity of extreme climate events. As is commonly observed in many natural resource dependent communities in EMDCs, individual and community best approaches may continue to prevail for adaptation. Use of nature-based solutions, local ecological knowledge, and a small scale frugal technologies will be important. As the bank focuses its operations in emerging markets and developing countries, concepts like go retail to adapt mechanisms might be an area for us to work on, considering the systemic lack of access to technical, financial, and institutional resources in these countries. Uh, one of the ways forward is through broad-based public-private partnership models, multilateral and bilateral funding, private sector technology and uh, information support, governmental coordination, and individual participation in sharing the risks and the rewards of adaptation could promote innovative adaptive behaviors and thereby keep the cycle of growth sustainable and resilient. In the end, I would just like to flag two things, that the community, the global community needs to work on technology, and, and, and for that we need a lot of funding, and with these two elements, I think we can make a breakthrough. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, follow up question, I think um, you mentioned that, uh, so, you know, when we talk about the post-COVID economic, global economic recovery, we will always emphasize, uh, you know, it must be green and sustainable. I, I think everybody in the room and outside the room agrees that uh, the, 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 the recovery must be sustainable and green. But it's always, you know, talk, when we talk about the uh, economic, economic recovery, particularly in the developing economies, it always comes with the... Uh, Huge cost, right? We must pay respect to the uh, on the ground realities, right? For example, we know Indonesia is, is a coal rich country, and Saudi Arabia is oil rich country. So, so how how, can, how you you can really uh, make a balance act between a real 
uh, green, you know, re economic recovery and uh, paying attention to the local, uh, you know, lo we call the competitive advantage or lo local realities. I think it's always, you know, long-term questions. That, that's a very interesting and an incisive question, and I wish we had answer for that. Uh, but uh, two, two things I would like to highlight here. Yes, we have to be conscious of the realities. Unless we are conscious of the realities, uh, it will be extremely difficult to achieve our goals, whatever pleasures we might make. That, that's very clear. Uh, secondly, the good part is that all across the globe, the resource countries, uh, the resource rich countries as well, they are conscious of the fact that it is after all one planet and you have to, as uh, I think Ambassador Shapui mentioned, otherwise you die together. So given that this reality that the countries are conscious, uh, people are conscious, individuals are conscious, that makes us job so much easier. Now, how do we do it? Yes, we have these nationally determined contributions. And uh, let me mention uh, our member countries like China, India, uh, Russia, and uh, Russia, South Africa, Brazil, and, and the new members that are joining, all of them are focusing on this green trajectory within the constraints of their own uh, resource, uh, resource availability and requirements. Given this, there is sure to be progress and energy transition given the technological constraints is going to take some time it is not going to happen immediately and there will be enough time to move away from these fossil fuels to uh, renewable energy and other sources of energy like uh, France, Belgium and, and some other countries are using uh, electricity which is absolutely clean except that it is considered to be in some ways dangerous. Uh, what's going to be your approach to that? And maybe as we invest more and more in technology, we'll get new, uh, newer technologies which will be safer and, and absolutely green. So I would again say that we have to bank on the goodwill and the support of all the countries to pursue this agenda because they are now conscious and they are driving it themselves. It is not being imposed from outside. And secondly, we need to push on the technology front in a big, big way by dedicating some fund towards that. Great, thank so thank you. So we are good to have another person from your multilateral development bank. So uh, uh, Eric, now it's, it's your turn, please. Great. You have a presentation. Okay. So, so thank you, and let me break the pattern by showing you some slides. But first of all, I want to say how delighted I am to be back at the Saishin Summit. I was fortunate enough to be there when it all started. And um, it's amazing to see uh, the, the development of, of Saishin. And, and of course, now, when I'm living in China, I'm benefiting on a daily basis from the excellent reporting. I think there's no other source that, that uh, contributes as much to my understanding of what's going on in China. So, Congratulations. And, and also the way you have managed to respond to this challenge that the pandemic um, put to you and, and created this innovative format um, that is um, a, a, a statement uh, about your, your uh, capacity to, to adopt to, to constantly changing circumstances. So what I want to do is to show you some uh, slides based on a report that we published a week ago. It builds very much on the previous interventions. Um, it focuses on two aspects that we are uh, look, seeing now and that's come up in the previous presentation. One is, of course, this huge divide that has emerged uh, in terms of, of um, vaccination rates, but in terms of, of growth. And for the first time, we, we are seeing advanced economies growing faster than emerging economies. And of course, the other dimension that I want to maybe start with is the clogging up in, in the whole global uh, production and transportation system. And um, you know, there's not a day when we don't see uh, the, um, the symptoms of this, this dislocation, these disruptions. And, and, um, and I'm going to start from uh, the global uh, value chains, because they are 
uh, you know, extremely important and have been important levers for emerging and developing countries to join the global production system. And, and I'll come back to how important they have been and how important they will be going forward. But let me first say a few words about the current situation. So it has already been described, the, these um, uh, clogged systems, the uh, increase in transportation costs, and um, you know, that's what led us to think about uh, what can we say about the global value chains based on, on this uh, extreme shock that they have been exposed to. And when you look at it, the first thing that strikes you is how quickly the system came back. And particularly here in, Chi in China, the, the, the rapid re uh, recovery after the lockdown in China uh, is extraordinary. And it, it, it's an attestation to, to the uh, flexibility and, and of logistics in, in this country. But the second thing that we are seeing now, uh, which are so fundamental, uh, are these uh, consequences of the asynchronous these, uh, lockdowns being opened up in, in, at different pace in different uh, times in, in different parts of the world and how that is uh, feeding through the system. And then, of course, you have the buildup of, of demand and, and uh, uh, coming out of the stimulus, coming out of the, the um, buildup of savings during the pandemic. So all that is now playing out in the system it's a bit like with inflation, you know, you have many things that are, are temporary, but, you know, if you have many things that are temporary and they last for a long period of time, they all have a, a bit of the same impact as, as permanent changes. So I think it's too early to say what will be the end result of this. You know, there are these pressures that come from, from, uh, from uh, uh, the new uh, economies where we have become more... Uh, capable of using uh, uh, digital technologies. But there are also very strong pressures uh, coming back, of pushing these uh, arrangements back to where they were in terms of this hyper-efficiency, these very strong relationships that they are based on transferring uh, important information, uh, trust-based uh, uh, arrangements. Uh, and, and so we will see. And, but um, I think in the long term, the economic drivers will be uh, the important dimension. But I'm going to make an argument now that, that there are many challenges to, to these global value chains in the short term, in the medium term, but also in the long term. And probably the most important that, uh, of that, them are the green transition that we have um, just spoken about. But um, before I do so, let me just show you what's happened to, to these uh, global value chains in terms of the relative importance, because this is fundamental when we try to see how can we get out of, of this uh, trap that we are in now with such, such a uh, difference in, in growth rates between emerging and, develop, and, and, and advanced economies. And what, what you see here is, is uh, the uh, participation in global value chains. And you, you see this very kind of dramatic uh, decrease in advanced economies, but the very fast uh, increase in the particip participation from emerging and developing countries. And, and it's not only China, it's, it's many other parts, uh, particularly of Asia, that have managed to, to use these levers, you, this chain that has come by you being able to just produce a small component rather than a whole car uh, to enter into global production. And it's been a very important uh, driver of, of a global development. And, and different countries have used this in different ways. So some have, like China, has moved upstream, taken more and more of intermediate products. It also upgraded technologically much more high tech in, in the part of global value chain that China is responsible for. But India has taken a different approach or has focused more on the specializing in specific activities, introducing ICT and so on, and, and getting competitive to that. There's no real, uh, you know, it's not better to go upstream or go downstream. It depends on what your uh, local context is, what your comparative advantage is, and what activities uh, you, you, you want to specialize. So different strategies are, are possible to, 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 um, to use when you want to get them. And if you look at China, and we have a whole chapter looking at the impact of global value chains on China. But the one thing that stands out to me is how global value chains has allowed 
the economy to address some or to be, develop in parts of the country where it was quite difficult before, so the, in the interior, and particularly look at what happened to Chongqing and, and to Chengdu and, and their participation in the global value chains have increased dramatically, much more high-tech uh, activities in these parts. The, the, the railway connection particularly to, to, uh, to Europe uh, has really had a strong influence on this. And, and you can see on, on these maps how, how uh, very fast and, and how um, profound this change has been. And, but now we have, I would say we have facing with these global value chains a challenge that is dwarfs these other pressures that are on these value chains. And it's the, how do you green uh, and decarbonize these uh, value chains? They are transporting goods many times in, across the globe, very long distances. They, and the production requires a lot of um, uh, uh, carbon-related products. You have very large carbon footprint from these global value chains. We see this also as a huge opportunity. There's a it's a challenge, but it's an opportunity. There are these uh, lead firms that build these value chains, it's all based on their capacity to impose you know, uh, prices inside these value chains, impose common standards, and, and create transparency around what's happening at different stages in this value chain. That com capacity can be used to drive the green transition. It offers us an additional tool to achieve what's been so difficult today, uh, push countries and, and encourage countries to across, across countries to, to drive this green transition and also to uh, push it across different sectors uh, uh, this, uh, the, using the, uh, the DVC lead firms is very important. But it also offers another uh, driver which is very important because now countries that want to attract these global value chain investments, they need to be able to offer green infrastructure. They need to be able to offer uh, you know, green power, they need to be off, able to offer green multimodal transportation systems. They need to be able to offer uh, digital architecture that can make use of, of these uh, global value chains uh, efficiencies. So that combination and that virtuous cycle of on the one hand driving uh, these, uh, putting pressure on these uh, uh, lead firms and encouraging countries uh, to uh, use green comparative advantage as a way to attract investment, we think can be very powerful. And, and certainly as, as a multilateral development bank involved in infrastructure, this is, we see a very important role for us to work with these lead firms, help them decarbonize uh, global value chains, work with countries to try to green their infrastructure to attract these investments. So f to summarize, the DVCs are challenged, and they are challenged in the short term, they are challenged in the medium term, but in, in the long term, we argue that the green uh, transition is the, is the major challenge, but it also offers this uh, opportunity for climate smart development, uh, and it's a, they, it also gives us an, an additional tool to reach the net zero transition. And it ultimately, of course, these arrangements build very large stakes, common stakes, that we all have to benefit from, but also have to invest to protect. And, and that, to me, is, is what makes me hopeful uh, about uh, the future. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And a very quick follow-up question. So do you think Asian economies, particularly East Asian economies, are able to you know, repower world economic recovery as they did after the financial crisis? So. so uh, I think, you know, it, as I said, the, the basic observation now is that emerging economies are, are struggling and, uh, and, and developing countries even more so, and, and particularly, of course, in, in Africa and Latin America. But also in, in South Asia, these are very real challenges that are facing in the short term in terms of uh, the pandemic and, and having low vaccination rates and, and the, uh, the virus continuing to mutate and so on. So all that is are very real challenges, but I think the way out of this is to really focus on, on what I have 
talked about here. It's about investing in, in, in green infrastructure, in, in providing green power, providing uh, green transportation, offering uh, broadband uh, digital infrastructure. That's the future. Thank you. Yeah, we'll come back to the United States. So, uh, Mr. Ninami, now I, I hand all the floor to you. Sorry. Uh, it's, yeah. Thank you. Do you unmute? Could you unmute yourself? We cannot hear you. Thank you, Shan. I'm so sorry. It's okay. I'm not good at it still. It's a great honor to be invited to this great and you know, amazing uh, panel of Kai Shen with the, uh, these uh, distinguished panelists. Let me touch upon about Japan. I mean, two topics. One, Japan's economy, including Prime Minister Kishida's policies. And uh, two, Japan's uh, role from a global perspective. Uh, first of all, Prime Minister Kishida just took the office and uh, his policies will be basically um, um, continuation of uh, economics, which means still loose monetary policies and the fiscal policies, and uh, just a little bit of uh, structural reform. This is a lot that still needed to be done. Like uh, we have to increase the inflation rate from the current net zero percent to at least one percent, which might allow tapering for Bank of Japan, and that should be discussed as early as possible, considering the world economy as a we learned uh, from uh, other panelists today. If uh, this operation starts, it would be a significant sign to the world. Japan is ending 30 years deflation economic mindset. I hope this will happen. And we need um, a structural reform, including a reform, reforming the social security system for the young and uh, uh, working population. However, this will not happen until the, the uh, next elections, which will take place in July 2022. Currently, Japan is uh, in relatively good shape in terms of a pandemic control with uh, very few new cases of COVID-19. Now, about 200 nationwide and one death on average per one week amazingly very small number of uh, infections now. And uh, the vaccination rate uh, reached already 80%. Uh, that works very well. I mean, in terms of uh, controlling this pandemic. Having said that, huge problem is here, lies ahead, which is uh, the recovery of Japan's economy is still slow. I believe uh, pent up demand will be seen very gradually. Why gradually? The fundamental issue is that the people do not trust the government so much because the government repeatedly declared state of emergencies. People are still afraid of sixth wave, which is essentially understandable with the aging population. Let me touch upon the, a little bit of the aging population. The aging population impacts the economy in every aspect toward uh, conservatism. This is a compelling fact, even to other advanced economy, to large or small extent. So we have to address this issue and uh, um, pretty much uh, uh, influencing to the, the, the world economy, I believe. Now, we have some solutions. One, in the short term, we have the huge accumulated uh, uh, cash at the level of the household. That is what uh, we call household saving. That reached already as much as $300 billion due to the pandemic, only for two years. Mobilizing this cash towards consumption is essential to Japan's economic recovery. The government has to be more effectively communicate the safety measures that are being put in place like a, we will start booster shots from January and to encourage more consumption. But that makes sense. 
and building on rising desire to travel and dine out. I'm sure Prime Minister Kishida will play a key role for this to demonstrate his strong leadership to relieve the general public. Further to driving the consumption, how to increase productivity is another big issue for Japan that needs to be addressed. There's so much room for improvement. So I hope to see more investment in areas, including digitalization and sustainability. By the way, uh, let me touch upon again cash. Our private sector in Japan carries as much as uh, $3 trillion US dollars in their and our balance sheet and a huge cash. This will make a way toward the much needed uh, um, inflation as well as a potential uh, of uh, potential economic growth, which stands at now 0.5% to at least 1.5 to 2%. Um, I think uh, all the driver is a private sector and uh, I think uh, Prime Minister Suga, uh, after them, Kishida, both I mean, three prime ministers continuously tried to incentivize the private sector. At the same time, the distribution of wealth also needs to be addressed. This is uh, uh, Prime Minister Kishida's uh, main theme. Abenomics effectively raised the stock prices, but uh, its benefits did not trickle down to middle class and the low income class at all, in a sense. So Prime Minister Kishida will try to redistribute that wealth. And uh, the first program will start by raising uh, wages of essential workers like uh, childcare and the healthcare workers. But having said that, it's uh, clear that uh, on the other hand, we need to get the economy uh, on the right, right track uh, before talking in depth about uh, redistribution of, of wealth. So let me touch upon the second point about the Japan's global role. Now, on, I think uh, it's very clear. Japan's most important role is uh, its uh, role as a flag bearer of a free trade notable in the leadership in realizing CPTPP, Japan, EU, EPA, and Russia. Uh, there's no question about the importance of a global value chain we talked about now. So I'd like to contribute to this uh, space still continuously, and I hope uh, we can work with China toward this uh, um, uh, path and to keep the uh, you know, free trade, though it's, uh, it's been under attack because uh, people say this is uh, the, uh, one of the reasons to create the inequality. That must be true, but uh, we have to consider how to distribute, redistribute the wealth as a result of the benefits of trade. And the trade pacts not only embrace the relationship in trade, they are also all means, I mean, also means uh, to strengthen the world's readiness for the new era, increasing, accept, incre increasing access, accessibility of developing nations to the global supply chain, as we talked about, and accelerating discussions on the ways to address modern issues like sustainability and the digital assets. In particular, I'm uh, highly concerned about the gap between ages reality and the net zero initiative being led by the United States and the EU. I respect the comments uh, by ambassador, but a reality of Asia should be uh, more addressed. Although the agreement recently announced by China and the United States at the COP26 indicates international cooperation, including all parts of the world, is a must. If Asia doesn't get involved in the conversation on key factors, such as taxonomy, Asia will not be able to keep up with the global initiatives, resulting in a sustainability divide between Asia and the world. Just to take a look at the renewable energy, for example, it's mentioned frequently as a key factor, but considering the geography and the rainy climate of Asia, conventional renewables like solar or wind power 
is not the solid solution for Asia. We need a greater variety of technology like hydrogen, geothermal, and perhaps nuclear. This kind of unique Asia perspective must be included into our discussions. It cannot be denied that the Asia is at the center of the sustainability issue. Asia is the world's greatest greenhouse gas emitter, and it's also at the center of the global supply chain. But Asia also can and must become the center of the solution. Asia, starting with China, has the technology and expertise. I strongly believe we Japan should demonstrate its role as a flag bearer and also lead the way to fill the current gap between the West and the collective Asian countries together with China and contribute to the development of an action plan for Asia. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Ninami, and a very quick uh, follow-up question. So as the uh, economic advisor to Prime Minister uh, Kishida, so I think a lot of international investors worry that uh, uh, Prime Minister Kishida's slogan, New Capitalism, may reverse the uh, deregulation which was initiated under uh, Abe administration. So what's, what's your take on uh, the New Capitalism and uh, this kind of reversal of the deregulation process? Well, to be honest, uh, I think it's too early to say, but uh, this is because Prime Minister Kishida has a more fundamental task that must be achieved, which is uh, alleviate the um, prevailing and uh, spreading sense of anxiety among people, uh, like inequality because of the pandemic. Currently, the general public does not trust the government so much. That repeatedly, I, I, I told you before, I mean, in my statement, the first step for Mr. Kishida is to crack down on the anxiety to direct the accumulated household savings toward consumption. That's the first thing he has to do. And an increase in consumption will bring about an economic recovery. And definitely that will lead to wage hikes of the working population. That is hugely needed. Winning back the public trust is a prerequisite for the success of all other measures. I'm uh, very much hopeful Prime Minister Kishida will demonstrate strong leadership like that. So um, we are discussing uh, new capitalism. However, the key thing is uh, how to give the relief to the, the general public foremost and the first and the foremost. Great. Uh, given that uh, we almost run out of time, so I just want to raise the second round question. Only one question for all of our panelists. The question is, what do you think, uh, which do you think is the biggest obstacle or you know, barriers in hindering global economic recovery in 2022? So before uh, you guys ask, uh, answer the question, so, the question reminds me of Larry Summers, the former uh, Treasury, U.S. Treasury Secretary. He mentioned that he really worried about the so-called uh, secular, secular inflation or secular stagnation. So it, it, it turns out that the current uh, uh, ongoing uh, uh, inflationary pressure uh, proved him to be partly true. So anyway, so l l let's turn to uh, Professor Yun Ding. So what, what will be the, the biggest the, uh, uncertain factor affecting global economic recovery in the year 2022? Thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Yu, please go ahead. Pandemic. I think this is a very, uh, I mean, this is biggest uncertainty. This is the first one. The second one is uh, geopolitics. Uh, we don't know what the policy the Biden administration will follow. I think this is also very important. Uh, economically, I think uh, uh, the prospect for the global economy, I mean, in terms of economy, is not that bad, even though we are facing lots of challenges. Yes, uh, inflation. But I don't think uh, there will be a stagflation. Uh, inflation, I tend to think is uh, transitory and uh, with uh, the wise policy adopted by other reserves and uh, uh, 
treasuries in the United States, then situation can come down. So on the whole, uh, economically, situation will not be very difficult. The thing is pandemic and geopolitics. Thank you Thank to you. pandemic and the geopolitics. How about you, uh, Mr. Ambassador? Well, uh, I would like to stress what uh, Bert uh, said in Singapore earlier. Uh, main obstacle in 2022 are the growing inequalities. Uh, and, there, and if there is no consensus at G20 level uh, to uh, deal with that, uh, and starting by vaccination, and uh, I'm sorry to say, but there's a lot of propaganda going around. And when you look at the true figures of who is doing what in Africa, uh, then uh, uh, maybe uh, action should be taken very soon. And two, nobody to said anything about it except maybe illusion through bottlenecks. But one main obstacle in 2022 to uh, recovery is uh, the very different policies across the world on international mobility. If China, just to take the example of China, China is not alone, but China being the second major world economy, if Chinese borders continue to be close to traders if the Ningbo Arbor can be closed for three weeks because of one COVID case, while every day you have thousands, tens of thousands of cases in Europe, then something is very, very wrong in terms of globalization and the global economy. So it's not a plot to subvert China to ask for Chinese borders to reopen when the world world is reopening, China cannot be an exception. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Professor Hoffman. Uh, so, number one will remain the, the, the management of the, uh, of the pandemic, and the, which includes the rollout, which includes the resolution of bottlenecks, etc. But second, uh, I, I know what it was asked for one, but the second one is really uh, the domestic politics in the major in the major countries around the world that in turn might prevent the uh, uh, the international cooperation from happening. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Kishora. Yeah, pandemic of course is there, and there are related challenges, and uh, which have been spoken about. My biggest worry is that amidst so many challenges around we should not lose sight of investing in infrastructure because investing in infrastructure gets jobs for unskilled and semi-skilled labor. So not only for 2022, going forward as well, it's important that we continue to remember infrastructure as a priority. Thank you. Uh, Eric? No, I, I certainly belong to those who, who think that for the next year, the pandemic will be the dominant feature and, and the, the feature of the pandemic that matter most is the unequal vaccination. And by far the most important investment that can be done today is to invest in, in uh, getting vaccines into people's arms. And, and the fact that this is not happening and it's not happening on such a huge scale makes me very concerned about the future of global cooperation because we already see it in G20 this year how the front lines or the demarcation between the advanced economies and the emerging and developing economies have been deepened and it feeds over into many other issues uh, that and including climate so that is to me the main concern for because we're going to need this cooperation to deal with all the challenges we are facing and and if we cannot solve this fundamental issue and and i think there are some very straightforward and, and not easy, but, but uh, uh, possible solutions uh, in terms of reducing stockpiles of vaccine, uh, making sure that these are um, actually used and, and we are 
taking policies, as was mentioned, that are consistent across countries to make sure that uh, we uh, address this inequality. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Nima, Nim, Ninami? Yes, thank you. Um, there are two issues. One is obviously pandemic, but uh, some other perspectives are different than the, the already commented. Uh, how to manage the fear of the people spreading around. And uh, uh, vaccination is a, a huge resort, but uh, how we can reduce the uh, frequency of pandemics. And we have to address the uh, biodiversity, which is at risk. And I think that's a very important issue. And how to manage a new normalcy. And uh, we have to observe uh, consumers as well. And second, uh, I totally agree with you, Professor Hoffman. I think uh, uh, supply chain, uh, uh, which is a, a huge issue now, but how we can um, shorten the uh, stumbling block in time uh, from the current peak to toward the normalcy. I think uh, this is another issue because uh, our economy is uh, so much uh, uh, influenced and impacted by the uh, supply chain. So um, I think uh, Asia is the center of the solution for that. Thank you. Thank you, great, um, because we are really squeezed for time. But finally, I will say thank you for all panelists. So we know every crowd has its stable lining, and we hopefully uh, next week, and uh, two leaders from both US and China will have a virtual meeting. So this will, will, will be the first uh, summit uh, since the Biden administration uh, went, in, went into White House. And I think the, uh, the, the virtual summit will definitely uh, stabilize and at least put a floor under the most important bilateral relations in the world, central US relations. And actually, we have seen some positive signals and signs from the COP26, uh, uh, COP, COP the joint declaration by, by US and China to deal with the climate change. Particularly, China has promised the first time China in the international arena to promise to, uh, to reduce its methane its emissions, one of the most potent uh, uh, heat trapping gases in the world. So ho hopefully we have seen some positive signals talking about the easing of the travel restrictions and, uh, and the life going, to, uh, going back to normal. So anyway, we hope uh, that 2022 will be a, a better year than the 2020 and the 2021. And thank you again for your uh, participation and your insights. Let's give us a loud applause to our all three virtual participants and the three uh, in-person participants. Thank you so much. Have a good lunch. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Huan. Ladies and gentlemen, Next, let's switch our venue to the Singapore venue. I would like to invite Madam Li Xing, Managing Editor of Taiching Global, and Mr. Kenneth Griffin, Founder and CEO of Citadel.